Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whenever you're listening. This is Davisville on KDRT-LP 95.7 FM in Davis, California. We live at kdrt.org online. I'm Bill Buchanan, and I thank you for tuning in. Well, if this were a normal year, we'd be talking about Frankenstein today, because it's October, and because the Davis Shakespeare Festival planned to present a play based on the book by Mary Shelley as part of its 2020 season. The pandemic has stopped all that, of course, but David Shakespeare, I'm glad to say, is still with us, and it's the much bigger part of the story anyway. My guest today is Rob Salas, a co-founder of Davis Shakespeare and co-artistic director, and he's talking with us today by Zoom. We'll talk about the festival and the pandemic and maybe a little bit about Frankenstein, too. Thanks for joining us, Rob. Thanks so much for having me, Bill. So, you know, Davis Shakespeare is an interesting story for Davis for at least two reasons that I can think of. One is the venture itself, the plays and the company, and another is its ambition to become a true established theater company and the progress that you've made in your first decade toward that goal. But I'd like to start today with the current state. The pandemic, obviously, I think we all know this, it's made live in-person performances all but impossible. How is David Shakespeare doing this year? Uh, you know, I think how uh, a lot of us are doing, you know, it's, it's weird. We're in a world of weird where <laughs> we don't know exactly how to plan things. We don't know exactly how to produce things in this moment. You know, so we've tried things since March. Some have been very successful. And, you know, when we feel like we've found something that works you know we keep doing it and uh and that's been a lot of fun so we had shakespeare reading groups which have been a blast and also a an online youth workshop over the summer and that's that was really fun to navigate the uh virtual environment with young people and then the program that has kind of continued since spring we've done it we're heading now into our third program of our digital internship program and so that's that's been kind of the the primary focus because uh, we've just found a lot of traction there. There's been a huge need, I think, nationwide for college students and students just out of college that had internships with theater companies booked that don't have them now. And we built in the spring a, a, a format to really kind of engage a cohort consistently for a, like a semester length internship mm -hmm. and that's that's been a lot of fun and and they've been producing work from that and it's uh, i think that's kind of something that we'll probably keep doing you know until the, the pandemic kind of uh, starts to melt away is that the uh, summer online theater festival that you're talking about yeah yeah so for the summer that was the second time we did the program we really had it culminate in this showcase where the interns that we worked with from all across the country worked in three teams to produce three shows. And we kind of coached them a little bit on the way, but they mostly just created it themselves after we provided uh, like a, a series of workshops and seminars and stuff prior, then they used our platform to produce. So, you know, as I listen to you, it strikes me, um... There's a real professional development streak in what you're doing, right? Uh, that's part of why you exist. It's obviously to present plays in normal times. You'd have audiences in there enjoying the work, learning from the work. But you're also as interested, it sounds like, in helping actors and other people in theater develop their craft. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's essential right now. The way that people think about theater, I think especially in 2020, the industry as a whole is kind of, as they've been put on pause, sort of, as I'm sure every industry has and every business and every person looked in the mirror and kind of had a, had a lot of questions to ask itself, themselves, you know? And I think that we wanted to give a platform, especially to young people starting their theater career, to engage in those questions rather than just kind of have to sit back and wait while they're college theater departments or their local theaters kind of figure it out. We're inviting these young people with us to think through these big questions and think about what should theater look like now and what should it look like in uh, the next couple of years. Yeah, I mean, not to take away anything from the severity of the pandemic. I mean, obviously it's fundamentally a, a crisis, but it strikes me that 
one of the ways that people have responded to it is said, well, it has thrown us this curveball. What can we do in this space? And certainly the world was headed towards more of a technological presence anyway. And what I'm hearing you say, I think, is that you thought, well, what can we make of this as well as not just how do we cope with it? Absolutely. Yeah. So through it all, though, but David Shakespeare will be able to continue. I mean, one of the concerns for nonprofits and arts groups and well, even going businesses is surviving the financial impact of all this. So you, you guys are doing OK in that area? Absolutely. Uh, thank you for asking. And, and yeah, I mean, I think the industry is struggling altogether. I think we, like everyone, are experiencing that struggle. And fortunately, there have been some great resources to help not just us, but a lot of companies through, through the CARES Act, through generous regular donors, you know. And I think that we have a unique advantage that though we're now kind of a, a larger company in the region, we don't have a, a permanent theater home where we're kind of really needing to produce work month to month in order to meet the kind of, kind of like monthly mortgages and stuff like that. We, we have a, an office space that we use all the time year round, but you know, we rent the theater from the city of Davis. And we're, we're not hurting as much as other theaters have been hurting. And I would want to really point that out and encourage everybody to consider, especially in this time of giving donations to not just us, but all arts organizations that are trying to battle through this. And, you know, and hopefully there's a second kind of stimulus package that comes that helps out businesses and, and, and artists. Yeah, the, the CARES Act you referred, that was the federal bill earlier this year, I believe, right? Right, and, right. And there's been thoughts that maybe Washington would produce another one. Hard to say. We're talking on what's today, October 6th. It could change right. day to day, I suppose. You know, one question, I, 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 you were on my show four years ago, I probably asked it then, but one of the things that I think is interesting for Davis as a community is that you chose to locate here. And I guess I'd ask that question uh, again. Why base this here? There's larger audiences probably for you in the Bay Area or Los Angeles or larger areas. So why base Davis Shakespeare Festival and all that you're doing here in Davis? You know, it, it goes back to when we started 10 years ago. We produced Romeo and Juliet outside at the UC Davis Arboretum with nothing, you know, and we were thrilled by the, the response. Um, sorry, I, there, yeah. <laughs> it's like a leaf blower outside. Okay. Is that really distracting? Uh, no, we'll just make a note to the audience, though. If you hear something that sounds in the background like a leaf blower, that you're probably right. This is one of the wonderful things about Zoom. I'm being somewhat sarcastic here. You can pick up things. We're not in the studio, but uh, okay. we'll, we'll do like you do on stage. You acknowledge the presence of the animal on the side of the stage, and then you get back to the uh, show itself. <laughs> Great. Yeah. I'm trying to project over it. I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, so when we started in 2010, we were stunned that there was such immediate community response that people came out to see a show just from a flyer that we hung around town and, you know, some word of mouth. And just the momentum of the fact that it grows every year. We have enough theater experience, you know, around the country that that's not, that's not something that happens with regularity. So that, yes, while there are like larger markets, I guess you could say, but we're looking at year-to-year -year growth and, are, and have always been thrilled. More audience, more support, more, and that support is from individuals, it's from organizations, it's from community groups, from the city itself. And th that's just always been on an upward trajectory. And so, you know, we're thrilled to see how far it can grow. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think uh, inherent in that choice and in what you're seeing is sort of a bet that Davis, the community, is able to support something like this and, and is interested in, and willing to. And that's probably, think back to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival years ago. You know, it got established in Ashland, Oregon, which would not be a, a likely place to establish something like that. And yet now, of course, pandemic aside, and for that matter, wildfires, because they've had a problem with smoke in the sky, it, it has moved along. And, you know, that's, that's got to be an example that you guys are aware of. And uh, uh, one, one thing that we noticed years in, once we were bringing in artists, visiting artists, was that really Davis does kind of also fit as a kind of destination theater in that everyone that comes from out of town, or whether they be actors or audience, they have a great 
day or weekend staying here. Davis has so much to offer. And then, you know, the proximity to Sacramento, to the Bay, to wine country, it's like really made sense for people to include us like in a longer trip too. And so I think that's, that's something that, you know, we see as part of the growth, you know, and, and, and how much do you plan that growth? I mean, there's, it's not unusual for an arts group or a nonprofit to start with a lot of heart and a lot of energy, particularly from the founders, you know, and then after a few years, they, they can peter out. That hasn't happened. As you talked out, you know, 10 years ago, you were doing things in the, uh, it was the gazebo, I think, on campus, wasn't it, UC Davis? Right. And, and, and now you've been at the Vets uh, since 2014. I'm wondering, I mean, you have a board of directors, you're, you're, you're organized. I think you're a 501c3. A lot of thought went into that. And I guess, do you, do you have long-term growth plans? I mean, is that part of what you do? I guess it'd be the business side, but are you planning to grow and taking steps to help that happen? Yeah, absolutely. We started this with experience and inspiration working at Shakespeare festivals like Utah Shakespeare Festival and Oregon Shakespeare Festival and, you know, have, have the vision of what something can be after several decades, uh, in Oregon's case, after many decades. And I think just seeing what the initial steps would be, what the five-year steps would be, 10-year steps would be, yes, that's something that we have thought about. And one of the first major things was you know, becoming a member theater of Actors Equity Association. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we're in the transition to do. We're part of a program with them to do that over uh, five or six years. And we're halfway through that and things have been going well. So we, you know, negotiate a contract with them to every, at the start of every year and, and, and follow through with it. And in a few years, then that will be officially with them a small professional theater which then is a, an important transition just as becoming, you know, in, in becoming a professional theater. And then there are other kind of benchmarks like that in the industry that you kind of want to hit. And, and I think it's, it's a balance of just doing that like systematically, but then also making sure that you are doing it, not, that you're not going too quickly, that you're not biting off more than you can chew, that you're, constantly reflecting and questioning, you know, is, is this the right next step for us? And I think that that's another thing that this year, though it's been, you know, awful for everybody, ha has been like one of the small silver linings is a, a more deeper kind of reflective moment of how is that growth journey going? What can we be doing better? When we do come back, you know, what kind of plays do we come back with? You know, we've, we've adjusted our mission statement, for example, on our website. Well, in fact, I, I noticed that. I was reading through it. In fact, here we should do a quick station ID. Uh, we're talking with Rob Salas, who is a co-artistic director and co-founder of Davis Shakespeare Festival. I'm Bill Buchanan, and this is Davis Phil on KDRT. I, did, I looked at your mission statement, and I saw that you've really taken Black Lives Matter to heart. And how has this, how will this change your work as a festival and the works that you present? I, I think it'll change it a lot without losing the identity of who we are. But, you know, I think that we, you're right. Like we were deeply inspired by the protests in March and April, as I hope everybody was individually and every organization was, you know, in our region. And again, I hope everybody has been looking in the mirror and asking these sort of important questions about, you know, how you, how you live your day-to-day -day life and how you kind of contribute to your community and all of that. And I think, especially as a classics company that always does celebrate the classics, we've always, though from the beginning, you know, we, one of our goals in our, in our original mission statement is, you know, let's take Shakespeare off the pedestal and let's make it more accessible. And that's something that we've always done with Camp Shakespeare and we've done in our productions. We, we do heavily cut our productions. We do really try to help those plays out with design and, and uh, other choices to really kind of move them into the present moment. But I think beyond that, it's, it's how do we really kind of understand that classical theater is primarily through a white male lens? Mm -hmm. and, and what can we do actively to challenge that? You know, not just be a, a supportive ally, but really kind of actively anti-racist theater makers that are, you know, wanting to be kind of co-conspirators with, you know, marginalized groups in the region. 
So like, I would imagine this could affect uh, the plays you choose, uh, how you cast, how you stage, maybe how you edit. If you know you're taking a, a classic and you edit it for the stage. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's it it starts with ourselves, you know. And and I think that again, it's kind of like how do you take the correct steps to do that? And it does start with us looking in the mirror, uh, both myself and uh, Gia, the other artistic director. We're both Mexican American directors, and I think by you know, that's, that's a voice and a perspective that we've silenced internally over the years because we're trying to meet this kind of classics model, this kind of professional theater model. And, you know, it was only last year when we produced The Tenth Muse by Tanya Saracha where we really stepped into our own identities. That play is so much about race and what it means to be Mexican, what it means to be, you know, a Californian. And like, and... I think that was so deeply impactful for us that we were already, I think, kind of so moved by that show and that that experience that we were kind of headed in a direction, you know, and, and this year, the way we wanted to tell the story of The Tempest and Into the Woods and Frankenstein was going to be informed by that. But I think, yes, March and April, like really kind of was another push of like, let's celebrate the diversity within ourselves, within our staff, within our community rather than feeling, you know, that, that we need to kind of do what's right or expected. But you mentioned the three plays that you were going to have your season this year, Into the Woods, The Tempest, and Frankenstein. And I would like to talk more about Frankenstein in a minute, because after all, Halloween season is upon us. Are you still planning to do those shows next year, assuming that the pandemic is over, or are you going to reevaluate? Well, I, you know, we're trying to build three models of... <laughs> what we'll be doing because we know nothing about what's going to be possible in 2021. So that is one of the possibilities. The possibility also is that, you know, it's still digital for another year. Uh, you know, it, it, Dr. Fauci said a few months ago that he, he doesn't envision live theater coming back until a year after there's a vaccine. Yeah, that's um, the national uh, expert on, uh, I, I don't know his exact title, but he's the one everyone's been listening to. Right. Uh, out of Washington about the state of, of COVID. Right. And so, you know, we listened to that. And, and so we, we, we're accepting the possible reality that we could be digital for another full season. So we're planning for that. And then there's the kind of like hybrid in between of like, maybe there's a way we could go to the theater and film something and then like live stream it still in, in a theatrical space, but without audience, you know, so right. It's well, like, I take your point. De depending on the format, you, you will affect the plays you choose. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Like, you know, I don't think we're going to do that. But I, I think those shows we, we are deeply inspired by and we'll probably visit them again. Like, it's mostly unlikely that we'll do all three the way that we were planning to. You know, I think that yeah. we, we may break them up a bit. But yeah, we'll, we'll have to see. You know, I did want to talk about Frankenstein, as, as I've said. You know, I think it's an interesting choice, particularly for a play. What most people know it for, of course, is the movie from the 30s with Boris Karloff as the monster. But of course, it's based on a book by Mary Shelley, who, if I recall correctly, was 19 when she wrote it. And the book is different than the movie. I mean, it, it, you know, the monster is, speaks quite a lot in the book. Uh, your description calls it the world's first science fiction novel or cites others that say that. And the play was based on, what uh, uh, was written by Nick Deere, based on the book. I, I guess, um, well, here, I'll, I'll quote the festival's description again. It says, the play honors the book's ambitious exploration of man playing God and is frighteningly relevant to today's world. And I wonder if you could elaborate on that relevance. Yeah, I mean, it is uh, a an existential year for all of us. <laughs> and, it's, yeah. and this is an existentialist story, I think, about how powerful men can be, humans can be, and how powerful should we be? And, uh, is, you know, what are the implications if you kind of do go beyond your individual scope? What does that bring something terrible? And I think that uh, <laughs> we can apply that to some people in power currently in uh, our country and worldwide of this kind of God complex, you know, and I think that the, this story, this, the play, even more than the book, kind of does, I think, critique the scientist a bit more of, of going beyond um, what he can handle, you know. 
Well, that is one of the core uh, aspects of the story, right? And, and, and in the movie, it becomes kind of a morality play, right? That there are things with which humanity should not tamper, basically. Right. And uh, if, if I was hearing you correctly right now, you're saying that that's still addressed in the play. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think in, it, it is one of those stories that, uh, you know, you get two full perspectives. And it, in, in the book, you get uh, a lot more of the creature's psychology and his perspective. And he's kind of a genius person as well as being like a, you know, a villain that can leap over mountains and stuff. But, uh, but he's quite talkative in the book. Yeah, he's talkative and he's extremely powerful and fast and terrifying. And so um, by getting his perspective, I think Mary Shelley kind of gives you a bit more of this is the creature's perspective, this is Victor's perspective, and you kind of have to weigh the both. And I think the play leans more towards, uh, and I can just say this since, you know, we're not doing it anytime soon, but it, it, it leans a little bit more in favor of the creature's perspective, that the creature is the victim of the, of the situation, that, this, that Victor went beyond his means and then became a cruel person. Yeah. And Victor uh, is Victor Frankenstein. Uh, yeah, be becomes, cr is cruel towards the creature, does not uh, love him, and becomes terrified of him himself, and then wants to destroy him. And that, uh, I think that the morality of the play is like, you can't do that. You can't, um, you can't be cruel to anybody, even if you're frightened of them. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm more interested in seeing the play now than I was before, Rob. I, I hope you still stage it. Yeah, I, we'd love to. I mean, I, again, just to touch on what you were reading about the description uh, and what you, how you even introduced the title. Uh, we Frankenstein is still kind of synonymous with that movie, with the green face and the bolts in the head and all of that. And we think that's kind of a tragedy. You know, that we're we're feminists at heart and and Mary Shelley wrote this genius novel at a very young age, and it's one of the greatest novels ever written. And uh, it itself is brilliant and uh, terrifying. And the fact that it was kind of railroaded by this movie and, and that this other perspective that had little to do with what she wrote it does a disservice, I think, to the to the world, uh, because what she wrote was better and and more insightful. And um, uh, you know, we're, we're we are classicists at, at heart. That's our trade. And I think both Gia and I, and uh, would when we had the opportunity to read Frankenstein in high school, I think for her and college for me. Um, and then when we saw it from the National Theater performance with Benedict Cumberbatch when it premiered, however many years ago. Um, it, it we you know we're we're just kind of floored by the story and how geni and how genius it is and how genius Mary Shelley was yeah. and uh, we loved that the play kind of celebrated the book. We've got a few minutes left. Um, I want to ask a, a broader question, and and that's about theater as a plays as a as a, as a thing to do. Um, you know, I, I know many people who don't go to plays. Uh, uh, you probably do too. And it's not so much that they're opposed to it. I don't. I think I know anybody who says, oh, I'd never go to a play. It's just they kind of don't think of it. Or maybe the scheduled aspect of it is a deterrence, you know, because you can't time shift a live performance the way you can a video. So as someone whose life is theater, I wanted to ask you, what do people miss when they don't go to theater? I think uh, theater is the ultimate opportunity for self-reflection, for community reflection. It kind of takes the pulse of, of where you're at and where we're collectively at. And I think the fact that everybody's headspace has moved kind of more in that direction by force because of the pandemic, I think theater is going to not only be um, something fun to do when, when we can do things again, but it's going to be something that's even more important to do for us all to sort of check in with each other and r remind ourselves of our collective humanity. Theater always does that and that's why I love it. And that's why I, I, I you know, I enjoy teaching it. I, I teach at Sierra College, uh, intro to theater and acting. And I, I 
have loved doing this company and sharing the work that we've been able to do with members of the community and the conversations that it starts. And I, and I think it's that, it's that conversation in the lobby after you see a moving show uh, and you compare it, if it's a Shakespeare to other Shakespeare performances you saw and how aspects of this interpretation struck you differently. Or if it's the 10th muse that's asking you to think about what it means to be um, in California and what you know the Spanish influence was and how how much they ind destroyed the indigenous people in our community like those kinds of conversations those kinds of uh realizations i think are that just make you a better human as as you move through the world so i think it's i would encourage everybody to go because it's it's i think it's like an opportunity to deepen just your life experience now that's but like the caveat of it is is that so is so is film and so are other artistic uh, engagements. And I, I support, you know, all of the arts and I love movies and TV shows and everything. But I think theater, the highs are higher. <laughs> like yeah. you know, the, the, just feeling it in the flesh, that f deep three-dimensional experience, I think is, uh, it just makes it more direct and impactful when you see an amazing play that can't really compare, I think, to any other form. So um, maybe it's like a, a concert is to a recording. Right, yeah. And certainly the performers are taking risks up on stage. You have to pull it together. Everything has to come together. Uh, but maybe you catch magic in a performance one evening, just like you might at a concert. Absolutely. And I think that that's, that's the reason to go. And it's, risk, and, and it's the risk factor. You, if you go see a movie, chances are it's going to be great because there's a million, there have been a million producers and hands on it, processing it to ensure that it's gonna be a certain degree of success, uh -huh. successful. Theater, is, it is more of this risk of like, you know, did, did it work? That's why sometimes you can see a show at, uh, on Broadway or, at, or an Oregon Shakespeare Festival and you can feel like, well, that one didn't work, you know? <laughs> because yeah. you, no matter what, no matter how much support in theater, it's still a little risky. And I think that's also the fun of it, is like, you know, how did this group do over this process of building the show yeah. for this moment for me in this two hour period. And that, and that, that's fun. That's something you want to be a part of, you know, and, and of course we're out of time now, but I'm reminded you just described a little bit of the experience of having a, a live interview like this over zoom. I mean, uh, we knew basically what this would be, but didn't know how it would work out. So anyway, Rob, thank you for taking the time today uh, to talk with us. I've thoroughly enjoyed this. Oh, thanks so much, Bill. It was a blast. This is Rob Salas. He is the co-artistic director and co-founder of the Davis Shakespeare Festival. I'm Bill Buchanan on Davisville on KDRT. Thank you for listening.